I'm nowhere near. My face will not do with that. Can we get rid of these ones? And we'll just leave the, the power problem, create a bit, of a bit of a vibe for us tonight. How about that? Uh, tonight there'll be an altar call. You can be sure of that. <laughs> I will be uh, preaching about killing a very fat man and then making an altar call. Uh, uh, it's not going to get emotional and soppy. Open up with me to the book of Judges. If you're visiting us, we're very glad you're here. Uh, you are welcome. Uh, you may not feel uh, uh, like this is a safe place tonight during this sermon and this sort of passage, but this is the best place. If you're an unbeliever, this is the best place for you to be because this is where God puts on display his glory in Jesus for sinners like you to be saved. Uh then uh, this is a, uh, the best place for you to be, the most right and proper place for you to be. Uh, if you were here this morning, it's even better to be at church twice a Sunday. And so here we are in the Word of the Lord, and we're in the book of Judges. Now, for a little bit of context, uh, we've come to the book of Judges for uh, basically a, a, a death to pietism and a death to Gnosticism. That's our aim. And what is pietism? What is Gnosticism? I've had a few people grab me this weekend. I thought piety was good. Why do you hate pietism so much? Uh, piety is great. Piety means heart religion. It means an internalized spiritual religion where it's not just external acts of ceremony, but it is an internalized faith and love and obedience and holiness before the Lord. Pietism is what says the only religion God wants and the only religion that this kingdom age really allows for is an internalized religion. So uh, acts of outward boldness or, or, or things that are more physical than seem spiritual. Uh, we don't like that. We, we, want, we want Christians to have G-rated lives and, uh, and, and, and quiet and basically toothless and clawless life. Don't be a danger to the enemy. Uh, be basically the kindest and nicest person you can be. But I tell you, if you memorize the catechisms and pray a lot and learn some of the original Greek, that's all God really requires of you. That's pietism. And it's actually a veiled cowardice that finds itself able to sort of excuse its inactivity through holiness and through spiritualization and through self-justification. And we say, when we read the fullness of Scripture and when we are familiar with history, which is ugly... Biblical history, we said this last week, biblical history, history beyond the Bible, outside of the Bible, it is ferociously, gut-churningly ugly. And if we are history deniers and we want to be, you know, uh, uh, peace-loving, uh, uh, G-rated Christians, nothing like that happens in God's world, it, foster, it creates a cowardice that fosters a softness in the minds, in the hearts, and then consequently in the mission of God's church. So, this is not uh, tonight's passage. You'll, uh, you'll uh, love it when we get there. This is not a call, uh, if you're unhappy with yesterday's election results, to hide a dagger and then go and visit your local parliament. Not, what, not the application. I'm saying that straight from the get-go, not the application. Uh, starting a militia and taking down a parliament house in Canberra, not the application, at least at this point in Australia's history. We've had, uh, we'll, we'll have, need some more degradation before that would ever be uh, needed. Uh, moving on. But we're not calling for violence, we're calling for a reality about the fact that God has sanctioned violence in the past. You can't read your Bible and not be aware of that. God sanctions violence, commands violence. We quipped last week that the judgment upon the Israelites in this book is that they didn't kill enough of the original inhabitants. That's the premise of the book. They're under God's judgment because they didn't kill enough of the Canaanites, Amalekites, Amorites, and Moabites, and Perizzites, and so on and so on. That's the, the premise of the book. So can you turn with me to Judges chapter 3, and we will, be, we will be in verse 12 of this chapter. So far, uh, God has brought the promise, His people Israel out of Egypt through the wilderness under Moses, then with Joshua, and He has taken them into the promised land where with Joshua they were waging war and they were obtaining they were inheriting the promised portions of the promised land that was allotted to each tribe. This was good. It was a positive part of Joshua's ministry. It was going according to plan. They were winning battles and taking the land that was apportioned to them by God, setting up their family there and telling them the stories of God's gracious redemption from Egypt, praising God, fulfilling the promises of Abraham. It's a good story. We get to the book of Judges and the people have begun to forget the promises and forget the mighty acts and uh, works of God in the past. 
they fail in their faith and they doubt that God can really clear out the land before them. Their faith fails and therefore they, they lack obedience in God's commands and promises. And then the morals of the people lapse because when you don't obey God, you start disobeying God. And when people do that on a large scale, you get civil unrest, uh, you get civil social sin, this is called the West. Uh, when people disobey God en masse, uh, that's when politics and uh, society and civil level degradation kicks in. Uh, some Christians don't realize this, that politics is always just downstream of people's hearts. You get a whole bunch of people together, you put them on a desert island, uh, or you put them in the middle of a city, whatever those people love, and whatever those people love to do, will, uh, will uh, 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 cause a certain kind of political structure, will cause a, and influence the sort of people they have as rulers over them. The scripture tells us that um, uh, ju evil judges are really a judgment from God on an already evil people. Uh, so, for example, in the West, in Queensland, for example, there was no uh, military invasion that then forced upon the people of Queensland abortion up until birth laws. Men and women were fornicating, loving money and free sex, and wanted more freedom to kill their babies. Then the government gave them that opportunity because they already wanted it. There was no pushback. An enormous majority pushed it through. Why? Because civil, uh, social, cultural, political sin always happens on when there is individual lack of spirituality and piety. So this is what we see with the Israelites. They don't trust God's promises, so they don't obey him in taking the land. Then their morals lapse and lack. Uh, they start worshipping other gods. Not only is there political and social sin and unrest, but God judges them by raising up their enemies around them and either beating them in battle or pushing them out of the land uh, or uh, 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 stopping the Israelites from being able to take their land. So their failure is in Judges chapter 1 and 2 in the beginning of 3. We're shown this introduction that because of their lack of faith and God's consequent judgment, they are unable to drive out the original inhabitants of the land. The beginning of chapter 3 shows us, and then Othniel is kind of a simple template of what the whole book of Judges shows us in a cycle, which is that God judges the people for their disobedience. The people get desperate enough that they cry out to God in prayer. God sends them a deliverer. He rescues them from the hands of the enemy. Then that judge dies, and the people go back to their apostasy, their Baal worship, and their sin. That's the cycle of the book of Judges. I'm telling you ahead of time so that at the end of any of these wacky, twisted stories, you don't expect good news. At the end of every story, there is a return to sin and a return to their idolatry towards the other gods. This is one of those parts of Scripture. We said this last week. or remind us again, then we'll jump back in. It's one of those parts of Scripture that make you, uh, uh, make you test your theology. Right? You have to, if you're a Christian, you're a whole Bible Christian or you're not a Christian. If you're a whole Bible Christian, you have to deal with portions of this in Scripture, which we can't just allegorize and say the dagger that he stabbed the king with was the Word of God. It was merely a sharp sermon, which some interpreters try and do. We can't just do that. We can't make it false history that it was made up and added into the Bible. It's God-breathed. It's good for us. It's sufficient and it's helpful Get this through your heads. Reading these stories are good for your Christian walk. That's what 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse says. Reading these tales and these accounts of these assassins, these weapons of mass destruction, is good for your Christian walk. So here we are, reading the book of Judges. And it tests our theology in other ways. You know, people always say, um, you know, God uses failed people. Yeah. You need to read the book of Judges before saying that carries any weight. You say that, then you read the book of Judges, and you go, oh, maybe not that failed, people. Uh, we, we, we believe, you know, we're justified by faith alone, nothing in us. God, God doesn't find good people, he finds sinners and uses them. You really read the book of Judges just to test that you really know what you're saying. You read the book of Judges, go, am I going to the same heaven as these guys? This is going to this is gonna be intense. I've got questions, and... I can't answer any of them, but we're going to at least look at the story. So, we're in the story of Ehud. 
Ehud in chapter 3, verse 12. And he's in um, kind of mid-north uh, uh, lands of um, near Ephraim in Israel. And he is a Benjaminite. Here's the story. The people of Israel, again, did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel. See, God strengthens the arm of the enemy to punish his own people. God's sovereign over every tale that we read in the book of Judges. God strengthened the arm, uh, the king of Moab, Eglon, against Israel because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He gathered to himself the Ammonites, this is Eglon, he gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites and went on and defeated Israel. And they took possession of the city of Palms. And the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. So King Eglon has established a, an alliance with some of the other tribes, the Canaanite, uh, sorry, the, the pagan tribes around Israel, and they have uh, surrounded Ephraim, pushed them out of the palms, uh, pushed them out of the plains, pushed them up into the mountains, and they've established themselves back in their cities and made a stronghold. And so 18 years, imagine this, 18 years. Since like 2006 or something, maybe that would be, uh, two, 18 years. You've got teenage kids, they've known nothing but the oppression, the slavery, the heavy taxation of the Moabites. Uh, for a whole generation almost, you've got people, young men uh, fighting age in their, uh, coming on 20, who've known nothing but the rulership of Eglon. That's the king of Israel apparently to them. That's what, you know, my, my, my grandfather Joshua, he tells me stories of being released from is, uh, Egypt and all of the miracles in the wilderness and coming under uh, the great military prowess of Caleb and Joshua, coming into the land. And apparently this was God's promise, sitting under the mighty hand and the heavy tyranny of Eglon. Verse 15. Then the people of Israel cried out to Yahweh. And the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjaminite, a left handed man. There you go. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. So here's the story Eglon is one of the uh, tributaries, guys who the, the Israelites would farm, they would gather their meat, they would bring in their grain, and they would have to set these huge portions aside to go to the Mo Mo Moabites as sort of their, uh, uh, their Dane geld, if you will, to go and pay off the king of Moab, please don't kill us all. But they would take, they would send those, uh, that tribute to King Eglon by a tribute party. And that party would go into the very presence of the king, present the tribute of uh, Ephraim or of Israel, and then uh, as it was accepted, then they would leave. And so for 18 years, this is probably going on, and uh, historians and uh, 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 scholars and commentators read the book of the, the, ch the chapter about Ehud, the section here, and they say it's written like Hebrew comedy. There's phrases here and there, the way it's sort of told unnecessary details that weren't necessary are included into the story to make you chuckle a bit. And that's because this is a story of God winning. And it's a story of God winning over his enemies, making them losers. That's how that works. And it's the kind of story that not only makes it into scripture, but that was meant to be told around the campfires to all of the Israelite boys and girls. It's meant to be a story of joy and victory and triumph and a touch of humor. And uh, you get some weird details in here. First of all, he's a left-handed guy. But also there's this detail that for 18 years, the Israelites were back home wondering, strategizing, thinking, how are we ever going to get into the presence of the king? I don't know. Anyway, it's my turn to go and take tribute to the king in his office room. Then they would leave, go back home. I wonder how we'll ever get close to the king. And for 18 years this is going on. You've got Israelites in the throne room of the king oppressing them. It's hard to get that close. The, the Moabites are stupid. Who, let them change hands. Give them to, 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 to Moabite messengers on the door. Leave the Israelites far away. What are they doing? Bringing their enemy subjects into the presence of the king. And he's a dude who can't defend himself. We'll get to that part of the story. This is a strange uh, tactic of the Moabites. And it's also strange and funny that though their salvation seemed obvious... God hadn't chosen to bring them salvation yet. And as soon as he did, it's just a light bulb went on. And Ehud's going, guys, 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 wait, guys, I have an idea. <laughs> I see him every Friday. 
I, I'm in his office. I'm one of his secretaries. I bring him his lunch. We have a million opportunities here to maybe rescue Israel. And so God raises up, very smart, very cunning, eventually, Ehud. Look at what it says uh, in verse 16. Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, all right? So when uh, enemies of Israel overtake uh, them, they obviously, basically, they do a... a <laughs> Uh, I won't get political. They take away everybody's guns, right? They, 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 they take away everybody's weapons. They disarm the populace because they're much more uh, uh, c- controllable. And so this is Ehud. He's basically your, your ex bikey uncle who's forging for himself a Glock in the bottom of the basement, right? That's what he's doing. So he's, he's forging himself a sword illegally uh, in, the, you know, in, the, in the hiddenness of darkness where the, the Moabite police uh, can't see him. He forges himself a double gauge, sorry, a double barrel. Sorry, a double-edged sword, right? So he's got a secret concealed weapon that he's forged for himself in secret, and he's going to go into the presence of the king. Now, they didn't have x-rays back then, obviously. They didn't have uh, metal detectors. What they did was usually a simple uh, a check, a uh, visible check, and may- maybe a frisk, maybe a touch-up, make sure he doesn't have a-, a spear under there somewhere or a large sword. But here's the thing. Being a left-handed man meant he drew the sword with the opposite arm. His blade was always on his right thigh, which was almost completely unheard of in battle. Assassins, warriors, soldiers always had their blade on the the left side of the soldier. So he would come up, they would check him, uh, no blade on his his leg. Uh, Maybe they touched him, but he's been doing this for 18 years. They they know Ehud's deal. They know that he's very docile and pacifistic and uh, compliant, and so they're going to let him through. So here's what he does. He forges his own sword with two edges, a cubit in length, that's about a, 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 a foot, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. Right? So he's, he's concealed carrying here into the presence of the king, and he presented the tribute to Eglon, the king of Moab. Now, it kind of sounds like maybe he's making this up on his own, and this is sort of a lone actor uh, assassin, but as the story goes on, we see that he meets an army in hiding and marches back down and wins a victory. So this is a well-thought-out conspiracy to kill the king. Uh, he goes on in verse 17. So he presented the tribute to Eglon, the king of Moab. Now, Eglon was a very fat man. That detail is completely unnecessary in the story unless God wants us to have a chuckle at his enemies. That's literally why it's there. Zero detail needed. But he, not even that he was fat. He was a very fat man. <laughs> Which maybe says um, that he was so, you know, it has an eye towards his prosperity. He's feeding himself on these tributes of the Israelites. And God says, and he's very fat. He doesn't say he's successful, he's powerful, he's, he's a, 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 a victorious king. God calls him fat. Uh, if you don't want to get made fun of, don't pick a fight with God. That's basically how it works. So Ehud goes into his presence of this very fat man. And when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. Verse 19. But he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal, right? So he, he, he gives the tribute, signs the document, hands over to the king. He takes his men back uh, just outside of the city of Jericho was Gilgal. And near the idols there, this sounds like it was sort of a, an, a, a, planned, a plan in detail. So he goes back to the idols, exchanges some words. The other guys move on from Gilgal. He goes back into the city. And I love this. I love this piece of artful deception, Uh, although it's truer than you realize. He turned back to the king and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. (laughs) I have a word from you. And so uh, uh, this secret message, how gullible is this very fat man? I have a message for you. Oh, send all of my guards out quickly. I want to hear it. Oh, but it's secret. No one's allowed to be at the door. No worries. Get rid of everybody behind a locked door. I want to speak to the subject whose parents we killed, whose brothers we've massacred, and whose food we keep stealing. I'm sure it's a positive message. He has become stupid with his uh, uh, success. So he says, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded silence, lifted up his scepter. Basically, all of his attendants went out of the room, out of his presence. That's so dumb. (laughs) And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone. 
in his cool roof chamber. So he's all alone. They're up on the roof. He sent away his you know, palm branch holders and his fanners and his grape feeders. He sent them all off the roof. He's watching a beautiful sunset. Ehud comes up to him. As he was alone uh, in his cool roof chamber. And Ehud said, this is the better line, I have a message from God for you. <laughs> That's very true. He has a message from the true and living God and it contained no words. It was a double-edged sword which pierced very deeply. Look at what it happens. He says, I have a message from God from you. And he arose from his seat. He was excited to hear it. I love the detail there. And he arose from, like it's, it's included like it was a, quite an effort. And he had the dignity to spend a few minutes catching his breath, leaning forwards, maybe asked Ehud for, for a bit of a hand, and eventually he got to his feet, leaning on his, on his uh, uh, armchair hands, no doubt. And Ehud, uh, where are we? Uh, verse 21. And Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. Verse 22 is also completely unnecessary unless God just wants us to laugh. And the hilt also went in after the blade, and the, flat, and the fat closed in over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly. And the dung came out. <laughs> Ehud kills this guy um, without any of those details being added. He wins the victory. None of that is specific, needed, or necessary. But it's funny, and God puts it in here, to mock his enemies and set himself up as the great king and assassin and outsmarter of his enemies. So he drove it in so far that the foot-long blade got stuck. Uh, his hand was in also because the, the, the hilt was covered, so he had to you know, jab at the hut, drive, pull out his hand from the wound, and the dung came out. That is that he has stabbed him so deeply it's gone into his intestines and probably opened the other side or maybe the entry wound itself. And so his intestines under the weight of his own uh, a slouching begin to ooze out. From, I'm not going to get graphic, but um, ooze out. The dung came out of the very fat man. Then Ehud went out into the porch and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. So as this man is covered in his own excrement on his own throne in the cool of the day, a wonderful view, he starts going through the guy's wallet. He finds the keys. He pockets the keys. He walks out, closes the door, locks them, and then walks away quietly. Ehud knew what he was doing. This was a well-planned assassination. Verse 24. When he had gone, the okay, this next section, also entirely irrelevant. But God breathed so that we learn not to pick fights with God. And when he had gone, the servants came. And when they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, you sound the alarm, right? The, the enemy messenger is in there alone with our king, and the doors are locked. Or maybe, no, maybe they knew that he had left. Oh, okay, our king is alone, and the enemy locked the door behind him? Sounds some alarm. These were apprentice uh, 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 security guys at this point because what they did was surely he's relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. So th they got to know King Eglon well enough to know if he's disappeared for about half an hour, probably on the toilet. Takes a good while, doesn't have enough fiber. We'll just, we'll leave King Eglon. And they wait, right, because also they're standing at the door and the man is leaking they can smell it. They go, he's, he's on the toilet. Open up some of the windows. And they waited till they were embarrassed. That's funny. Can you imagine the conversation between the guards? That, who says it first? Like, who says our king might have died on the toilet? Who, who's the first guy to have the guts to bring that conversation to the table? Nonetheless, until they were embarrassed, they waited. But when he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber... They took the key and they had the key the entire time. <laughs> they could have opened it. Man, these details are so unnecessary. And there, there lay their Lord dead on the floor. <laughs> That's tremendous. Verse 26, Ehud escaped while they delayed, right? So they're waiting and waiting with an assassinated king 
covered in mess. They're waiting to the point of embarrassment. Meanwhile, an enemy army is escaping and amassing and coming back outside their gates. This is a tremendous embarrassment. This is, you do not read, that. I bet you, if the Moabites kept history, this story is told entirely differently. Eglon was taken up to the heavens. Uh, uh, we acted quickly. Um, uh, uh, not, it, there was nothing embarrassing. Uh, none of that happened. Don't listen to the Hebrews. They're all liars. That's, that's how they wrote their history. But Ehud escaped while they had delayed. And then he passed the idols um, and escaped to Siara. When he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. And then the people of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was their leader. And he said to them, follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went after him and seized the fords of the Jordan, that is the, the, the riverines and the uh, uh, lakes. They seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites and did not allow anyone to pass over. That is, they went and established a border along the Jordan River and ravines, and they stopped uh, pe the, the Moabites from being able to cross from the east across the Jordan River into their lands, into the Israelite God-given lands. And, verse 29, they killed at that time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied. It's so specific. They're not all fat. Some of them, the guys they killed on the war, in, in war, they were all strong, able-bodied men. Not a man escaped. That is pretty ugly history. That is PTSD-inducing history. These men, war-torn men, I think as we read sometimes like Sunday school, these stories that happen in the book of Judges and Old Testament history or New Testament history and what the Israelites must have witnessed, we sort of glance over like it happened and then they went and, and colored in pictures about it. These men would have been deeply traumatized, deeply affected. Mankind is not built to, to witness the bloodshed, especially of masses of image bearers of God before them and not be deeply, deeply affected. But such is the effect of sin in the world, and such is the kind of events that God uses in history, and such is the effect of the Israelite sin. There was a whole new generation of Moabites to have to mow down now, because the Israelites didn't do their job a generation ago. This is ugly history, but this is divinely controlled history. So Moab, verse 30, was subdued that day, under the hand of Israel. This is an amazing line. And the land had rest for 80 years. That is an enormous length of peace. The Moabites subdued in shame. Can you imagine the songs and the stories, if they memed back then, the online jokes, the story, the, the, the chants that would have circulated across the countryside to the demoralization and the shame of Moab? God says that's a good thing. You know, some people get a bit uncomfortable with mockery, probably the lies of Ehud, the deception at least. I have a word from God for you. Uh, the assassination. But back in verse 15, God called him a deliverer. It's the same word for savior. God said, I raised up a deliverer. And then evangelicals complain about his mean tweets and the sort of people he made fun of and he didn't respect people's pronouns and he could have been more compassionate. God said, you're missing what I did. I just raised up a deliverer. This is, the, this is the, 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 the good effect that I hope studying judges has on us is, wow, I complain a lot. Wow, I'm self-righteous. Right? This is not, not attacked at, a, at our congregation, right? But, but I think we can all take something of this. I'm so self-righteous. I read God's history. I'm worse than any of these guys as far as I know. But I'm going to complain about the ickiness that reading this story gives to me. And evangelicals either avoid this sort of book or try and argue for it as an example of what not to do. But we can't get away from the fact that God raised up Eglon, God raised up Ehud, God ordained the instances, and God got praise and worship for the salvation that he wrought for Israel. There is great violence which comes to produce peace. We'd love it if basically chapter 3 was this. The Israelites prayed. This is how a lot of pietists would read the book. Big Nico marker. They cross out everything from the end of verse 15 down to verse 30. It reads like this. The Israelites prayed to the Lord, and the land had rest for 80 years. 
Because sometimes spiritual acts of obedience require, demand faithful, physical acts of obedience. Many Christians are so afraid of this kind of idea. In fact, if you're a pacifist, like there's never an instance where God would want any Christian to be violent in any way. If you're a pacifist, you need to pick another religion. Because there are some out there that work fine with that, very peace-loving. You get enlightenment. You're allowed to smoke stuff, and they have cool dress-ups in other countries. You're allowed to do that. Christianity is not a religion for pacifists. I have spoken to pastors who, by my uh, assessment, are disqualified, not just unqualified, disqualified from being pastors for their views of pacifism. They rebuked a uh, church member, this one guy, rebuked a church member because the church member was broken into by a man, an aggressor with a box knife who held his wife at knife point. And the church congregant did all that he could to try and defend, ended up hurling something heavy at the guy's head until he ran away and was arrested later at the hospital getting stitches. The pastor in all of his holiness and eminence rebuked the church member for his violence. And, and the question was, well, what would you do if your wife was held at gunpoint or knife point at night time? You don't know if she's going to be assaulted, killed, at least robbed. What would you do? He says, I would do what Jesus would do. I would pray in the corner that God changes his heart. That's disqualifying for a preacher of the word of God. You shouldn't be allowed to defend any of God's sheep if that's what you would do to your own wife. That man is guilty of the sin of extreme pacifism. This is not the same view that uh, 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 the sword doesn't advance the kingdom of God. Granted. But pacifism that says there's simply never an excuse for the people of God to do anything violent is tantamount to simply ripping the book of Judges out of your Bible. And I invite you to do so because you don't read your Bible anyway. Pacifism like that ignores the fact that at least some of the violence in the world was actually commanded by God. That's not, a, that's not a, uh, an argument for violent lifestyle. It is a fact that some of the violence in the world was explicitly commanded by God. And some of the peace in the world was judged by God because they should have killed people. It's the book of Judges. If you just read all of the worship songs in the Old Testament and then read the worship songs in the New Testament, you will see that a great portion of them are praising God for crushing, destroying, squelching, destroying his enemies in literal death. And most of the time, it didn't come by an angel from heaven. The Israelites prayed, then there was peace for 80 years. The people prayed, God brought some kind of deliverance by the hand of Moses, Joshua, Caleb, David, Solomon, whoever it may be, through human agencies that brought about a great spiritual victor, and therefore there was peace after that. There is peace in the Bible. There's lots of peace in history, but it's always after lots of violence. That, that's just a, a reality of human nature, and Christians need to grapple with that, wrestle with that, and swallow that, or you start butchering the word of God. It's a theological issue. Romans 16, maybe you would quote Romans 16 and say, no, we should be pacifists. God is the God of peace. And it's true. Romans 16 does call God the God of peace. Can I read to you the whole verse though? The God of peace will soon crush Satan. There's your peace. God is a peacemaker, not a peacekeeper, not a peace tolerant kind, not a pacifist. He's a peacemaker by crushing enemies. Peace comes after violence. Great peace in the future will come after the return of Jesus Christ where he crushes his enemies. True peace comes after the destruction or the at least uh, putting down of enemies. And maybe someone would say, yes, of course, but, but God does that. God does the crushing of Satan. And it's all spiritual anyway. So well, what does he say actually? He says, God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, church. The Christians are the agents of God's kingdom marching forward over the head of Satan in the world, under your feet. Friends, this is in our Bible, whether we like it or not. We have to deal with it. We have to, in fact, thank God for it and then repent for trying to live in a sin-cursed world, to live in a God-cursed world with such a flamboyant and cowardly spirit. The only reason pacifists exist is because men... Good men are killing violent, evil men. That's why pacifists exist. But this is real history. 
History shows us that in this evil world, Christians who step out to do real good are sometimes met with situations where violence is literally necessary and the godly act. Let me say this. If you're a pastor, right, normal day-to-day Christian ministry, it's almost never going to be the case where it's necessary to kill somebody in the task of your ministry. I, I admit that with some sorrow. I need a, I need a, no, no, really, as a pastor, most of church ministry in life will go on and there'll almost be, almost be, never any need to get violent. That's true. But in the world that we live in, where Christians step out to do something good and godly, you will be met with, not just with, with people praying against you, but with people waging weapons against people you love. I'm in contact with a guy, he's an American guy, ex-Navy, and I messaged him. I said, can you give me an example, maybe in your own life, where something like the story of Ehud kind of, kind of comes out and he says, sure, here's a picture. And he sent me a picture of a deceased human being with no blurs. Let's just say that. It's up on the... No, I'm joking. He, he sent me a picture of a carcass. He's American, so... And he said, this man was leading a gang to come and take and kidnap a group of orphans in this other country. Me and my men were called to security. We came, we tried to neutralize. They wouldn't de-escalate. They came for the children. Now he's dead. Here's a picture of his face. I go, wow. And I decided that I probably wouldn't tell that in a sermon. So let's not, okay? Seeking violence meets Jesus' rebuke. If you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Pick fights for Jesus on the street, you're going to get kicked. You're going to get hit. You're going to die. But if you try, it's naivety to say that you can really, that that there will not be at least some times where Christians doing good for God and his kingdom will not be met with some actual violence, which needs to be met not with retaliative violence, but with defensive violence for innocent people. the, The kingdom of God does not advance by the sword. But sometimes the people of God need to be defended by the sword. Because bad guys have swords. Think of one example, General Mackay, who is one of my great, 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 great ancestors in Scotland, rallied forces, joined the royal. He was on the good side. He was the conservative. He sided with the Protestant king in order to fight against the Scottish uprisings and rebellions who were trying to put in 1690 uh, Bonnie King Charles II back onto the throne to establish a Catholic monarchy again and destroy the Reformation work in Scotland. And Mackay and his men and the soldiers met the Jacobite uprising and had a huge destruction upon their army and marched back home, praise God. Now, the kingdom of God does not advance by the sword, but sometimes innocent people or godly people or God's people need defense by the sword. Again, we don't have a hope militia. We don't have a hope army. This is not a, 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 a call for a return of, of kind of medieval uh, inquisition and, and, and violence. The simple fact is, though, this is in our Bible. This is in our history. The only reason it's not in our present lives is because good men have died giving us the peace that we enjoy. The Bible you read right now, in our language, came to us at the long line of bloodied men. Uh, John Knox uh, was a, I mean, it's Reformation Day, so happy Reformation Day, everybody. John Knox was one of the leaders of the Reformation in Scotland. But before he was a full-time preacher, he was actually an associate and a secretary, an apprentice, if you will, of a man called George Wishart, who was a saint. George Wishart was known for his holiness and his gentleness of spirit, and he's known as one of the forerunners of the Scottish Reformation. He was born in 1513. He fled to England because of persecution. He was charged with heresy for not believing all of Roman Catholicism's doctrine. He went from England to Geneva, where he met Bullinger and one, you might not know him, John Calvin. He learned how to preach the Bible line by line, and then he returned eventually to, to, uh, to Scotland, where he traveled the country preaching Romans verse by verse. There was a price on his head. He was chased out of the country for heresy. He returned illegally, and he came back, and he would preach every day, not knowing if this would be the day the royal army turns up at the church's door and kills him, and he kept preaching. He preached and he preached, 
Cardinal Beaton was one of the Catholics in power, a cardinal in Scotland, and he said, I would prefer myself to walk to the very gates of hell than allow George Wishart to establish a stronghold of Protestantism on my doorstep. So he, he amassed an army, a royal army, and he was chasing George Wishart all around the country with a royal uh, 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 censure to capture him, detain him, and kill him. Through his evasive action, he would preach and move around, and George Wishart stays safe for many months. He moved out of Dundee on the run. He fled from Dundee as the army was coming, but in the next few weeks, he learned that there was a plague breakout among the people of Dundee. So as a good pastor, he traveled back to Dundee. He started to minister to the sick. There he met a young John Knox, who was just a young theological student at the time. He took him under his wing, and there uh, he was met soon by the security guard, uh, by the uh, army of, the, uh, of Cardinal Beaton. While in, for those months, while John Knox was, the mentor, uh, was being mentored by George Wishart and working with him, he was actually his security detail. And George, uh, John Knox carried a huge Scottish broadsword on his hip, not his right side, on his left side, uh, on his hip, not a dagger, an enormous broadsword, uh, and that he was the security detail for a preacher. How many times would George Wishart maybe make it back into kids' devotional books about visiting the sick, and they'll conveniently leave out the part where his ministry protege had a broadsword on his hip? Eventually, though, under John Leslie and Deacon, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, under Cardinal Beaton, the Catholic, George Wishart was arrested, and as he was being taken away, John Knox raced to his aid to go along with him to make good on his vows of protection, and George Wishart said, son, one is enough for a sacrifice. He was taken, and on the 1st of March, 1546, after a mock trial, he was burned alive at the stake in front of many people. The Protestant response was not mild. The Protestant response was equally savage. At dawn on the 29th of May, 1546, a group of Protestant lords from Fife entered St. Andrew's Castle pretending to be stonemasons. This is Ocean's Eleven kind of material. They've got their, uh, uh, you know, plasterboarding, their, 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 secu- their, uh, their maintenance workers. They've got their fake mustache on. They've got the jumpsuits with, you know, St. Andrew's uh, uh, maintenance crew. Uh, and they've got, they've got weapons hidden on the trolley. This is what it looks like. They come in under subterfuge as secret uh, 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 assassins into the castle. They enter. They find the cardinal. They drag him out of his bedchamber. They stab him to death in public, then they hung him from a castle window in full view of the entire town. St. Andrews then became a gathering place for Protestants from all over the country, including John Knox, who rightly argued that that was assassination, murder, illegal, and a sin before God. He made them repent. But, If we knew a little bit more of their day, I mean, criticism is easy from a 20,000 foot view. They were men of their times, and that's not an excuse, but it meant they saw their times very honestly. Cardinal Beaton had over 20 illegitimate children that he had through girlfriends. He's meant to be under a vow of chastity. I don't know if you know why that's contradictory. I'll just leave the mums and dads to explain that. 20 children born through girlfriends, while he was under a vow of chastity, raking in an enormous income for the church. He had a woman drowned because she refused to say Hail Marys during the birth of her child. His illegitimate children, he worked into the church to become leaders and highly paid professionals. Yes, the murder was a sin, and we should not excuse it. But it happened in history. 
And we don't really have a Scottish Reformation without this scene happening. Not an excuse. We need, we need no murder, no zeal that turns into sin in our day, in our Reformation, in our revivals. We need to repent of the kind of anger of man that results in this sort of thing. But John Knox had the right spirit. He, he came into the situation. He commanded repentance. Uh, he, he fled for his safety to that area as the uh, army besieged, the royal army besieged the castle. And the men held their stand for five long months against the royal army. An amazing feat. And then there was a treaty, so people were allowed to go in and out. John Knox entered at that time. And he became a bit of a chaplain to the men in the army large part of his ministry was calling them to repentance and find grace in Jesus Christ for their murder of not an innocent man, but an illegitimately killed man. He was called on in that time to become the preacher of, uh, to the forces, and it is said then that the, the first congregation of the Church of Scotland met in St. Andrew's Castle while under the sieging of the royal army. After French reinforcements came to the castle uh, under this supposed treaty, the royal army called on French reinforcements from the sea who came and destroyed the defenses of the Protestants. They toppled their army and they found Cardinal Beaton not sitting on his roof cool porch covered in himself, but they found him pickled. Now don't laugh. Be very unholy of you pickled in a large barrel of vinegar in the dungeon where he killed John Rogers, one of the first Scottish Protestant martyrs. God's got a way of telling history. I'm not approving or disapproving either way. Of course, their sin was still used by God in the great story of the Scottish Reformation, whether we like it or not. This doesn't excuse anything. That would be a kind of hyper-Calvinism that says, well, God's sovereign, he's working all out for good, let me sin. We don't do that. This is, a, this is a story to not do that kind of thing. But it is a realization that history is ugly, and that's the only kind of history that God works in and through. John Knox, for his siding with the uh, assassins... Uh, was captured by the French army. He was taken and he was made a galley slave, which was, uh, historians say that the modern mind doesn't really have a comparative uh, scale for which to put galley slave life on. It's just worse than we can imagine. And they were in the low parts of the ships, rowing back and forth across the English and French channel. And uh, that was his life for 19 months. But his faith did not waver. In that time, he would uh, continually pray. At one point, it says that the, the soldiers uh, were passing around a little idol of Mary, making the, the prisoners and the galley slaves kiss it and pray to it. And John Knox politely said, that's an accursed image of Satan. I don't want to worship it. Very reasonable for a man in the galleys, I think. And they shoved it in between his hands and tried to push his hands towards his face to kiss it. And so he said, into the river with the lady. And threw, that was Irish, I know. And threw her overboard into the waters where she sunk, and he was treated brutally in punishment for his obedience to God. <laughs> Throwing an idol over ship, overboard, is obedience to God. And then eventually he would be released. He goes back to Scotland. He is used as a reformer in the Church of Scotland. He does not commit the heinous crimes of his predecessors, but like George Wishart, is meek, mild, but bold and strong in the cause of the Reformation. And continually, he often had his own security detail to protect him against the armies of the royal Catholics. This is our history. Look at Shamgar. Shamgar in verse 31. There's only one verse, but he's another weapon. If, if Ehud is a weapon of mass destruction because the thing he destroyed was massive, Shamgar is a weapon of mass destruction because his weapon kills an enormous army uh, against one man. There's a lot of unanswered questions about Shamgar. Uh, did he do it himself? Did he raise up a farmer militia? Uh, did he uh, do this all in one day? Was it guerrilla warfare? We don't know, but look what happened. After Ehud was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he also saved Israel. An ox goad. What's an ox goad? Um, Shamgar just seems like every teenage boy. He just picks up something and goes, how could I kill people with this? 
And so an ox goad was a large stick with a pointed end, uh, which you, you know, you'd have the plow on the, on, on the cows, and if they were veering, you would poke them with this huge, long ox goad. So he picks up his, his uh, 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 farming implement, and he goes to town on the Philistines and kills 600 of them with this likely eight-foot, right, almost three-meter long uh, ox goad with a pointy end. It's, you know, the old version of a cattle prod. Well, in the book, this is, this is the, the story of the book of Judges. Unlikely heroes with unlikely weapons. A woman kills a king with a tent peg. Samson kills armies with a jawbone. Uh, Ehud kills uh, this king with a left-handed sword. Uh, and here's uh, Shamgar with a cattle prod, with an enormous ox goad. So how does this apply to us today? <laughs> I have no more comment on Shamgar. There's not a lot to comment on. It happened. So here's the questions we've been asking as we're going through the, the book. Is what happened? What actually happened? Give us a real view of history so it's not all powdered and, and made up and soft. So we've done that, I think. We've traveled through the real history. Our second question is, is there any application for us today? Because 2 Timothy 3 says there should be. Thirdly, we'll ask, how does this move forward God's story of redemption? And fourthly, how does this point us to Jesus and all of its mess? And these last three are very quick answers. Here's our application for today. Don't live for people's approval, especially the people who live in your generation. Don't live for people's approval. Live for God's. And then do whatever is necessary and righteous in his cause. Not what is pragmatic, but what is righteous. Don't don't fear doing something because of the people of your day will blog about it and say you weren't overly nice. Don't commit sin because the people in your tribe will applaud it and not call you out for it. Live for the approval of God and God alone and do what is righteous and whatever is necessary in the cause that God puts in front of you. It seems to me that the Reformed Church is filled with people that the Reformation would never have happened under. The Reformed Church is filled with people that would have had nothing to do with the Reformation when it was actually happening, because it was way too real, unpietist, and at sometimes just ugly. Leonard Ravenhill says this, Ah, brother preachers, he writes, we love the old saints. We love the missionaries, the martyrs, the reformers. Our Luthers, our Bunyans, our Wesleys, our Asburys, etc. We will write their biographies, reverence their memories, frame their epitaphs, and build their cenotaphs. We will do anything except imitate them. We will do anything except imitate them. We cherish to the last drop the stories of their blood while we watch the first drop of our own. Don't live for the approval of people in your day. You will be entirely and absolutely forgotten as a pacifist in God's army. Don't do that. On second, uh, on, uh, second point of application, we ought to be a church that is not known on earth. That's not our aim. That is not our goal or dream at all. Shamgar gets one verse here. We don't know much about him. The Philistines probably have more of him in their history than we do in our Bible. Because he wreaked havoc on the Philistines. Don't try to be a church that is well known on earth. Aim to be, Leonard Ravenhill used to say, a church that is well known in hell. Who cares if the bloggers and the denominations and the groups and the, the, the lobbyists and the politicians have any clue you exist? Pray to such a degree, labor to such a degree, fight with such spiritual ferocity in the real world, in the real battle God gave you, so that hell knows your name, heaven has you on their watch board, heaven, hell has you on their watch list, and you're a known enemy of the state down there. Live to be known by them. Prophets sometimes have miracles, they always have holy unction. That's Ravenhill again. Sometimes they have miracles, but they always have unction that stands bold to earthly powers. We may get one verse or less or nothing of memory in history about you and I and the Lord's work here, 
but let us be well feared by God's grace in hell and our souls counted in heaven. Thirdly, how does this story, these two stories, move on redemptive history? Well, in one sense, by the simple preservation of the nation of Israel by fighting against the enemies, we have a fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham that he was going to protect that nation so that it was, despite all the, the, all, all the, the, the statistics, despite all the, the, uh, the, the likelihood, it would have an existence until the time at least that the Messiah came into the world. And here we see God fulfilling those promises to Abraham. But it also moves forward redemptive history in this way. It shows us that physical and political rescue is never enough. Bravery, physical courage is needed. It's never enough. It's never enough. Storming the castle and killing the cardinal politically seemed needed. They delivered the Protestants. It wasn't enough. It wasn't righteous. Ehud killing the king. Shamgar delivering them from the Philistines. It was good. It was never enough. The Israelites apostatized again by the end of the story. The snakes that are crushed are just little foot soldiers. The great serpent still rears his ugly head again. You can beat politicians, you can get new MPs in, you can vote in new presidents, wait for kings to die and their more righteous sons come along, you can fight wars, you can wish for new princes, but they cannot save or be God's agent of ultimate redemption. That's what this story screams out at us. So lastly, how does this point us to Jesus? We see that we need Jesus, who crushes the head of the serpent, Satan, under his feet on the cross and in his resurrection. Jesus then, through history, crumples every other king and kingdom who doesn't pay him homage. And there's no chance of toppling him like the fat king of the Moabites. He stands unapproachable and glorious in his kingly rule. Jesus brings salvation and controls history so that the New Testament tells us of his salvation that he has wrought for the new Israel, the people of God. Titus 3 verse 4 and onward says, When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. The same language from the book of Judges. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Jesus changes our hearts and makes us righteous and purifies us and forgives us by his grace. He died for our sins and he washes us and makes us new so that we don't return back to our idolatry and sin. And he stands at the head of history, controlling everything for the glory of his father and for the good of his people. The first time he did not come and king, uh, kill, assassinate, or wage war against earthly powers. He died in meekness, in embarrassment, and in shame to pay for our sins. But the next time he comes, he's coming to stomp heads of enemies. Revelation tells us. He comes to make a tidal wave of blood through the earth. He comes to bring judgment. And the second time he comes back, he's bringing none of his own blood to pay for sin. That's done. He's bringing back wrath to put down his enemies and then usher his children into the new world. My question for you is this. Have you made peace with this Jesus Christ, the great judge? You can today. You must today. Believe in him. Know your sin to be vile but believe in him for forgiveness. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word which confronts us. We thank you for its uh, uh, multiplicity and its variation uh, in all of the ways you've written it and told us stories. We pray that that we would have an accurate, fair, biblical, honest view of your history and the history of our own life and our own sin so that we can be stirred, uh, bolstered, and encouraged to stand firm in the real world we live, in the real context you've put us. Lord God, I pray that you remove from us the fear of man or human anger that brings about unrighteousness. 
but we pray that you would fill us with holy zeal, submission to the Lord Jesus, who has paid for us and won our souls at the cross. Please save souls tonight who believe in Jesus for the first time. For we pray all of this in the wonderful Savior's name. And everyone said...